So what's the opposite of alone? For me, my favorite time of day is very early in the morning, maybe around sunrise, a little bit before, a little bit after. It's a wonderful opportunity for me to get out, uh, do some things, maybe get some exercise, take a ride on my bike. Um, it's also a great opportunity to get some things done. And so last year I was completing this uh, blended learning supplement that I was writing for one of the courses I teach, and I was a little bit behind schedule, so I woke up early, and I was getting on top of things. And my wife, apparently woken up by me and not able to get back to sleep, comes down, tells me that, so I apologize, of course, because it's my fault. She comes downstairs in our house, and she gets herself a cup of coffee, and she goes over and she sits on the, on the couch. And she gets out her phone, and she starts looking at the news and getting herself oriented for the day about an hour and a half before she normally wakes up. So just a few minutes after that, my son, age 12, his name is Kai, he must have been woken up by his mom as she walked by his door, so he comes downstairs. He joins, us, or he joins his mom on the couch, he gets his, his phone out, he starts checking the football scores from the games uh, the night before. So for some reason, my entire family is having difficulty sleeping because my eight-year-old daughter, Phoebe, she gets up. Now, it's all like 5.30 in the morning or 5.15, which in Japan is quite, quite early compared to our school schedule. So anyway, Phoebe comes down the stairs, and you hear her bound down the top of the She looks over at me, and I'm on my computer. She looks at my wife, and she's looking at her phone. She looks at her older brother, and he's checking the football scores. And her face goes from anticipation first thing to sadness, because her people, the people she most wants to see first thing in the morning, are all busy. And she's right. This isn't the kind of thing we wanted. And to steal an expression from Sherry Turkle, we were alone together. The first person in our family to recognize that was my son Kai. So he put his phone down and he started talking to his sister. Right? Then my wife and I followed suit. We put it down because that wasn't what we wanted. We wanted to have some time together. And we didn't have a profound, meaningful conversation. It was sort of like, how did you sleep? What are you going to do today? Do you have PE? You know, that kind of thing. And, um, but it raised a question for me. And that is, how do we catch these moments before the moments pass us by? How do we catch the moments when we're together? Right? Or in other words, how do we cultivate the dispositions within ourselves, within our friends, within our children, within our students, so that we can reap the full benefits of technology, but also maintain the relationships that make life so meaningful and are so important to us? Some of the answers, I think one of the answers lies in this, and actually most of them lie in our direct experience. If we can appreciate that our lives offline are just as full and have just as much texture as our, li our lives do online, we can go across that boundary more seamlessly. Part of that equation is the presence of real risk. So recently, some researchers from the uh, University, uh, excuse me, the uh, Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, they did a study about risk and failure and found that with risk and failure present, our levels of empowerment and responsibility increase. Our ability to demonstrate restraint and foresight also increase. And these are four ideas that I think very much directly connect to the conversation we're having this morning. Another thing is the idea of real joy, right? If we can experience when we actually step across that divide, get back offline and just spend time with the people that we care about, doing the things that we're passionate about together, if we can experience real joy, that creates the motivation and that creates the willingness for us to step across that divide and then feel free to go back, but to step across more seamlessly. Not only is it important for us to disconnect from our constant connection when we're with each other, it's also important to do that experience the benefits of solitude. And if you look into the uh, sort of cross-cultural effects of solitude, by and large, they're, they're positive. One of them that maybe isn't so positive at first glance is the idea of loneliness, especially when you define it as an increase in our sense of depression or increase in our sense of uh, social isolation and an increase in anxiety. It doesn't seem so great. But when we actually get into those moments of despair, from there we learn how to pick ourselves back up through techniques such as self-distraction, or positive thinking, or other coping that has resiliency knock-on effects across other domains. When we experience solitude, we look at our environment differently. We innovate to express ourselves. And in this mindset, we, we design, we tinker, we craft, and we construct. Also from solitude, we, express a, we experience a freedom from concern. This is the freedom to take whatever time we need. This is the freedom to think those thoughts, to dream, to fantasize. Um, we also remove ourselves from the daily stressors. Solitude can also put us in touch with things far more magnificent than ourselves. And what that does is it snaps our concerns into proper perspective, increasing our ability to problem solve more effectively and allowing us to address the yet undeveloped areas of ourselves and our, and our circumstances. 
And lastly, from solitude, we can recover and we can rest, we can relax. And when we rest and relax with other people, that gives us the space to have the conversations about our basic values and our basic beliefs that make the future conversations that maybe are more difficult about more intense, higher stakes topics easier to approach. And at times, that mutual understanding about our beliefs and values can make those conversations actually unnecessary because they're prevented before they even start. So in thinking through my original question on how do we develop the ability to catch those moments of togetherness before they pass us by, or how do we develop those dispositions, I think the answer really lies in intimacy. It's an intimate connection to our reality, an intimate connection to each other, and the roles we play for one another. Thank you very much.